Welcome to Equity Mates Investing, a podcast where we explore what's possible in the world of investing. If you've just joined us for the first time, a huge welcome. My name is Bryce, and today we are discussing our portfolio moves. We have Europe's answer to the Magnificent Seven and a community question on compounding. To chat through it, as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you? I'm very good, Bryce. Very excited for this episode. As we like to talk about here at Equity Mates, over the long term, markets grow. And there's no better example of this than the Magnificent Seven growing into the Magnificent Eleven. Oh. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and if people aren't sure what the Magnificent Eleven is, stay tuned for the second segment. Oh, God. Because that's uh, Europe's answer to the Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent Seven, yeah. They do have uh, an acronym that um, was coined by Morgan Golden Sachs. Golden, and we'll get to yeah. that. We'll get to that. Now, before the show we kicks off, Ren, I have a big favor to ask from the community. Oh, good. Not from me. Not from you, okay, no. Correct. From the community, we've... Um, We've d done a lot of work over the last sort of six months with some new concepts and new segments that have come in. Pimp My Portfolio, Book Club is back, Industry Deep Dives are coming and we really sort of thank you for everything that you have uh, given us in the community survey. If you're enjoying the show and really getting a lot of value out of it, if you can leave a review and rate us on your podcast app, that would be awesome. We would really appreciate it and it goes a long way to helping us find new uh, Equity Mates listeners. So if you love what we're doing and you appreciate it and you're getting a lot of value out of it, uh, big favor, please just leave a re uh, five stars and a review. Yeah. Done. Nice. So uh, first segment here is all about portfolio moves um, and you've really been making more moves than I have. So over to you. Oh, this is something that we've been talking about offline for a bit. Um, fair light. Fair light, yeah. Um, okay, so for context, uh, Fairlight Asset Management is a small cap manager here in Australia. Um, they have come on the show a number of times. We've spoken to Nick Cragen probably Couple twice. Couple of times, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then Will Dowd. He was part of the summer series, well. yeah. Did the trucking um, company. And I think uh, every, and th this has been over years, yeah. since maybe like 21. Yeah. Um, I reckon every time we finish the interview, I ask if I can invest with them. Hmm. And I never do. No. And I think you're about to tell me that you've stolen my thunder. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've made an investment. But I think to go back a step. So a couple of uh, episodes ago, EM Chats ago, we spoke about how I had some... We did the lump sum versus dollar cost average conversation. And I had a bit of lump sum cash sitting on the side that you were yeah. like, why is quote, it not... swimming in pools of cash. <laughs> no, that, no, you won't be able to pull that quote up. Um, had some money sitting there. And my wife has also been keen to do some joint investments. She has her portfolio. We have, um, I have mine, but she's been keen to do some joint. And so I thought that was a good opportunity to make this investment into Fairlight. And okay. So we've done this together. Um, so why, why Fairlight? Uh, just because it's a fresh investment and it's not in any of our brokerage accounts. This is direct with them mm -hmm. um, and it was easy to set up as a joint. So I think from just the, without having to join brokers or anything like that, this is just a, a clean way to start our journey of investing together. Nice. Um, but I think for everyone listening at home, so Fairlight, they are a global small and mid cap fund manager uh, and we get super excited every time they come on. Uh, and for me, this is now pseudo outsourcing my satellite portfolio. This is how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is what <laughs> active management, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, could, you know, because we've done a lot of, um, a lot in it, Pimp My Portfolio is now with Luke and I, I have taken a bit of, you know, not advice, but have listened to what he's been saying in some part around the value that active managers can bring. So when I think about how my portfolio is set up now, We've got the core component that I'm super happy with and I've got a great strategy there and it's just going in. I've got a number of smaller satellite positions, but the biggest emission in my portfolio, Ren, is small caps. Um, and so if I think about the skills and resources I have to go out and find good small caps versus giving my money to someone else, mm. I think that, that's where I've landed. And so whilst they've only been around since 2018... Um, they have had pretty impressive performance against their benchmark and um, yeah, I'm willing to back them in. How have they gone? So they bench benchmark themselves against the MSCI World Small to Mid Cap Index. Um, it's per performed 9.6% since inception. 
um, since 2018 per annum, whereas Fairlight have done just over 14% per annum ne- uh, after fees. Nice. Yeah. So let, uh, I think that is worth talking about. We do talk about low cost and all that sort of stuff on the show. This is where, you know, it, it makes a little bit more sense to pay a bit higher fees or I'm, I'm comfortable in paying it. They do have a management fee of 1.25% and an admin fee of 0.05%. Uh, and then they have a 15% for performance fee when they outperform the benchmark. Okay. Yeah. So it's expensive. It is expensive. But, yeah. you know, if they're, they're doing, what, 4 or 5% above the benchmark after fees, then that's why you pay. That's why you pay, yeah. yeah. So how I'm thinking about this is this is uh, something that I will continue to invest in just like I do my core, but this will, you know, it certainly won't be a position the size of my core. It's going to sit in that sort of satellite Um, spot but um, yeah this is outsourcing a fair chunk of that satellite for me nice okay great Um, have you used any of your equity mates influence to like get a better rate (laughs) (laughs) no (laughs) should have should have yeah so I can see here you've had a look at some of their top holdings and I think the reason that I always get really excited when we speak to the guys from Fairlight is they always bring interesting companies that I haven't heard of. Mm. And for me, that's a real hallmark of, mm. you know, people who are doing different work or more work or are living in different circles and researching in different ways. And, and that's what really what you want when you've got an active manager. You want like a different view of the world or a different opportunity set. Um, yeah, I don't want them buying things that I c- could otherwise do myself. Yeah, if their portfolio mm. is... NVIDIA, Spotify, and Facebook. It's like, well, I know those Got companies that. and I could buy them. Exactly. Um, and, you know, that that never was that more clear than when Will Dowd joined us in the summer series and he spoke about Landstar Trucking, a company that I'd never yes. heard of, um, but a really interesting one. So tell us about some of the companies in their top five. So their def- top position is a company called Auto Trader Group. They're an online marketplace for car buyers and sellers. I'm pretty sure he came on and spoke about that a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one we've spoken about on the show before is Constellation Software. Oh, so when we say we're, we're really stretching <laughs> the definition of small caps here, aren't we? Oh, so they, they invest in anything from 500 million to 30 billion. Market cap? Market cap, yeah. And what's Constellation? I think we're somewhat skewed here in Australia with our views on small cap. Hold on, hold on. Constellation is 76 billion. Oh, oh, sorry. It must be 50. Oh, that's interesting. Well, on their website, it says 500. Yeah, 500 million to 30 billion. Maybe it's from initial investment. I mean, it's US. So this would be 76 billion Canadian dollars. So let's go to USD. Uh, Google's given it me to me in Australian. I, I, nah, still 56 billion US. Maybe it's from the time of investment. Maybe. <laughs> maybe that's the Maybe universe. they're letting their winners yeah, run. Yeah, they're letting it run. Um, <laughs> well, Will or Nick or anyone from Fairlight, if you're listening, uh, you I'll, I'll send him an email and come back to it on that one. I'll, sure. ha- I'll have an answer because it's a good, good question. But yeah, they're, they're, their universe is, fi- they say on their website, 500 million to 30 billion and they invest in 30 to 40 stocks. But to close out their top five, they have a, a company called D- Diploma PLC. When I looked it up, it was just a classic... All they do is supply specialized technical products and services. So, uh, yeah. And then Gartner and Scout24. So, IT consulting and another online marketplace make up their top five. So, of the five, I've only heard of two of those. Yeah. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is uh, a British stock, a Canadian stock, a British stock, an American stock, and then I think a German stock. Mm. So, one US stock in their top five. Love to see it. Yeah. Love to see it. So, yeah, um, looking forward to, you're going to make some moves, I assume. Yeah, look, I think this is probably the impetus for me to actually (laughs) sign up. Um, It's always just the admin heavy load. Well, yes, this has been administratively light, which is nice. It was all online. You did have to upload some documents. Well, not even, you just type your doc numbers in and it did all the verification online. Okay. And away we went. Yeah, nice. Yeah. But you still have to upload a signature. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I just did it on the page and took a photo. Yeah, of it. okay, yeah, 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 because yeah. that's the thing. You still need to sign in wet ink. Yeah, um, nice. Can you and then can you track? Are you going to track it through ShareSite? Are yep. you able to do that? Yeah, yeah, you it's can. got that functionality. Yeah, ShareSite you, does. You can. So we, you just get the unit price from 
the guys. Oh, so you got to do it manually, but yeah. TBC, I'll come back with that next week. Okay. Yeah, because ShareSite does have the ability to track this stuff. Usually it's like the M funds and those sorts of things. So I don't know. Uh, F- it was yeah. able to do everything through Equity Builder. So um, I'll find out like, okay. all of the products through Equity Builder. Yeah. Nice. Well, look, that's um, obviously nothing in this show is financial advice as our disclaimer at the very front says. And, you know, this is a move that Bryce and Harriet have made based on their financial circumstances, the pools of cash that they're swimming in <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and uh, their specific life stage and goals. So, um, you know, that yeah, that's... Not a buy hold or something. Yeah, but um, it's an interesting one for you to bring to the table. And I think if, it's, if there's any actions to take out of this, it's to go back and listen to our previous interviews mm with the guys from Fairlight because mm. um, they're some of some of our favourite conversations. We'll include the Landstar one in the show notes. Um, but yeah, just search Equity Mates Fairlight. So next stop, private equity. Oh, really? I'd love to. Don't know how. Going to have to bring some people on the show to find out. Well, uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. I, know, I know there are a couple of fundies now who have m- r- achievable minimums in their funds. but um, Is, So you'd prefer to... Put, put your money into a fund rather than put your money with a manage like in the management company as in like a kkr or something yeah because a lot of the big ones blackstone kkr um apollo they're all listed over in the us so you can just buy their equity mm. tbc I, I i think um i wouldn't mind a fund okay yeah yeah, what, well, what's your minimum? Your minimum is going to be at least like 50 grand. I know I know length. Schroeder's have one that's 20. But like the, the question that and like this is coming un, as an uneducated position. Yeah. But the ones with the lower minimums, yeah, do they also yeah, do they also yeah. have lower asset quality? Yeah, of course. Like as I said, the the superstar PE funds don't mess around with no, us because no, no, no. they go to like the endowments yeah, and the institutions yeah, yeah, and yeah. and they're the ones that <clears throat> By Sydney Airport. As I said. Well, that was a super fun, but you know what I mean. It's a next stop. So, um, a lot of DD to do from here. But I I think it's something I want in my portfolio. I would love, uh, and this might exist, I would love just an ETF that just owned all the publicly listed private equity players in equal weighting. Just one purchase and you got like 20% 20% each in the big five. Done. But do they actually perform well if you're like from a... From a listed point of view, or is it? Yeah, they, they, do. they do. Well, do you know what I mean? Like the return. Put it this way: Blackstone's up two hundred and sixty-three percent in the past five years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, not good enough for you. Nah. KKR's up three hundred and eighteen percent in the past five years. But okay, is that but, their, is that their fund? Like that's the stock price, but relative to Apollo fund, fund performance, Apollo up two hundred ninety-three percent in the past five years. Yeah. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> but you know what I'm asking. You know what I'm saying. It's like, what's the underlying fund performance in that same? Period? Yeah. Well, I'm sure there are some funds that have done better, but I'm sure there are other funds that have done worse. Mm. Because, mm. like, unlike equity funds, where if a, if there's multiple funds, they're probably all investing in. You know, like classic example, Magellan had a high conviction fund and a mm. global fund. Mm. Re- the overlap between those two funds was pretty high. It's mm. just that the high conviction fund was their best 12 to 15 yeah. ideas. The global fund was their best like 30 ideas or whatever. Yeah. Um, whereas in a private equity fund, each vehicle is buying completely different assets. Yeah. You know, they're buying, yeah. whole, they're buying a whole company in one fund, then they raise the next fund and it buys completely different assets. Yeah. So the discrepancy between funds is going to be a lot higher in private equity than it is in public equities. Mm. Okay. So that's me completely avoiding answering your question, <laughs> but saying I reckon there would be a range, a, yeah. And I reckon the the performance of their public, like the, of their of the management company's equity, would probably be in the midpoint of that range. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll take it on notice because that's um that's the next that's the next thing I want to be. No, don't take it on notice. Uh, Beta shares, Global X, Vanguard, and iShares. One of you make a. <laughs> <laughs> private equity ETF that we can just invest in. Yeah, true. There you go. Let's get it done. Anyway, Ren, um, that's it for portfolio moves. Let's move on. All right, Bryce. Well, we said at the start of this episode that we're done with the Magnificent 7 and we're all in on the Magnificent 11 <laughs> now. Uh, so, 
We first heard about these companies when we spoke to JP Morgan Asset Management's Kerry Craig. Yeah. God, I was sick for that interview. You were if sick people, for that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fresh are, off a golf trip. If people have <laughs> listened to it. <laughs> yeah, apologies uh, for that. Um, <laughs> but the acronym that was coined by Goldman Sachs is the Granolas. You, we've also heard them referenced as the Magnificent Eleven. So, introduce us to this world. Yeah, well, you mentioned that we first heard it in a recent interview with Kerry Craig, only a matter of weeks ago. But it was first coined by Goldman Sachs in 2020. Yeah. So we're, 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 we're a bit behind, behind the times. The, um, the term is granolas. And this refers to 11 stocks um, from the European stock market, which is, uh, I guess, the European answer to the Magnificent Seven. Yeah. Sort of answer. Sort of. <laughs> I, I, think, I think financial media has a real desire to pattern match and it's like something's happening here let's find it there you know it was the same thing in australia we spoke about the wax stocks mm. with three a's as our answer to the fang stocks over in the u.s there's just this massive desire to be like something's capturing a lot of attention somewhere how do we do make an equivalent okay. and this is a classic example of that, of that. magnificent seven magnificent 11 they are fundamentally different mm. the magnificent seven is like a concentrated tech um, grouping, whereas the Magnificent Eleven is a lot more diversified. Mm. And I would say there's a lot more interest in them because of their relative value yeah. rather than just their, you know, strap in and hold on to your seat, unbelievable growth story. Mm. But the thing that unites the two of them is that they've had pretty incredible stock price performance of late. They have, Ren. They've absolutely pumped out some incredible returns. So before we get to performance, let's actually go through what the 11 companies are that make up Granola. All right. I'll give you the letter. You give me the company. G. G is GSK, healthcare company specializing in pharmaceutical and biotech with a $68 billion market cap, up 13% in the past 12 months. Nice. R. R is Roche. Also in healthcare, they're a Swiss multinational healthcare company operating under pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, up 13% in the last 12 months, $210 billion market cap. Nice. Next up, we've got A. A is ASML, a tech company, $360 billion market cap. They make chip makers. They make lithography machines. Lithography machines. machines. Um, they're up 46% in the last 12 months. Uh, N. N is Nestle. Consumer, they call it consumer defensive, $235, $53 billion market cap. Uh, a Swiss company specializing food and drink, as everyone would know. They're actually down 15% last 12 months. Mm, this is a classic example of why I don't think the Magnificent 11 and yeah. the 7 are similar. Well, because listening. the world's largest food company is not the same as no. NVIDIA. No. Anyway, we've got to N. N. Next up, we've got another N. Another N is Novartis, a healthcare company, Swiss pharmaceutical 188 billion market cap, up 6% last 12 months. And then would you believe it? Another N. Another N, yes. Novo Nordisk, healthcare company, Danish pharmaceutical, uh, known for Azempic, $560 billion market cap, up 62% last 12 months. Now, next up, you would think that Granolas goes to O after this, but yes. Goldman Sachs are good at maths, not good at spelling, because <laughs> next up we've got... L. Yeah, so coming in at number seven is L'Oreal. I think they've dropped the L to get O so that they can make <laughs> granolas. <laughs> uh, consumer Defensive, a French personal care consumer goods company, 229 billion market cap, uh, pretty flat for the last 12 months. Next up, we have L. Yeah, finally, LVMH, uh, Consumer Cyclical. They're a French luxury goods company, up uh, market cap of $410 billion, down 4%. And now we've got A. Yes, AstraZeneca, healthcare, British Swedish pharmaceutical, 165 billion market cap and down 6%. Mm, most known for the COVID vaccines. Yes. Uh, no, coming in at number 10, we've got S. We've got S, which is SAP, German software company in technology, 219 billion. And the second best performer of the group up 53% 
for the last 12 months. Yeah, if people work at large corporates, they probably oh, use yeah. their technology to try and book, Do stuff. book leave amongst other things. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, number 11, we've got S again. Yeah, Sanofi, another healthcare company, French pharmaceutical, $111 billion market cap, down 10% last 12 months. Nice. So that in Goldman Sachs estimation spells granolas. Yep. In my estimation, it spells Grand Lars. <laughs> yes, Grand Lars. <laughs> but either way, 11 <laughs> European companies that span, well, a lot of healthcare, uh, some consumer companies uh, and luxury goods. Six of 11 is healthcare. Mm. US is tech, Europe is healthcare, and a bit of consumer is the, is the vibe that ca- comes out of that. And now, that- here's my question, Bryce. Mm. Have they just picked most of the large non-industrial companies in Europe? Well, it seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You mean they could have gone, you know, the Exxons and... No, well, Exxon's American, but... Um, you know what I mean, the B- <laughs> Shell, BHP, whatever. BHP's <laughs> Australian. <laughs> um, yeah, it's what I'm saying is there's a lot of just like large cap European stocks, ex-industrials, like ex-oil and gas, ex-materials, ex-resources... Um, I think what they have done here is actually taken companies that have contributed significant gain to the overall index, similar to what oh yeah, Magnificent Nest- Nestle done. down fifteen percent the last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do represent twenty percent of the combined value of all six hundred companies in the StockX Europe index, so not as much as well, no, the that, Magnificent Seven. I feel uh, like that just reinforces my point. What that there's there's bigger. No, that they've basically just gone all large caps ex industrials. Yeah, I think. Well, if you look at actually the biggest companies in Europe, these are eleven of the top fifteen. Yeah, that's that's yeah. kind of exactly what I was saying. Yeah, I'm gonna get it up quickly. But the Magnificent Seven's no different. They've just got Magnificent Sevens. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just the biggest, true, true, biggest true. companies ex. Well, not X nothing. Not X it's just nothing. The, it's yeah, just yeah, the yeah, biggest yeah. companies. Yeah, that's true. So what we should it do may, is it... come with an ASX 200 <laughs> top 10 acronym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just, it I, for me, it's like giving it an acronym gives the illusion of more yes. nuance yeah, and yeah, more work yeah, and yeah. more like stock picking. Yeah. Whereas really what they've done is just said, we're bullish on Europe. Oh well, yeah, we're bullish on the, yeah, on the biggest companies in Europe. Which is Europe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so if you're thinking about how they've gone from a performance point of view versus the Magnificent Seven. So I've got the top 10 companies in the StockX Europe 600. Nestle in, Novo Nordisk in, ASML in, LVMH in, Shell Industrials, Novartis in, AstraZeneca in, uh, Roche in, Total Energies Industrials, SAP in. So two out of eight. T- and they're the, they're the... Energy companies, yeah. 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 So anyway, that really just kind of proves where we're at. Yeah. Goldman is long Europe. Goldman's long Europe, and I reckon we should make an ASX 200 acronym. <laughs> see, what we, see what we can come up with. So if, in terms of performance, they've, uh, the, they've accounted for 60% of all gains in the European stocks over the past year. Makes sense. Uh, but if you look at them compared to the Magnificent Seven, so since 2021, total returns equal weighted portfolio. The um, granolas doubled in value with a total return of 103% compared to the total return of the Magnificent Seven of 128%. So not too far off over that period of time. I think the big difference though is if you look at what has happened over the last 12 months uh, where some of the Magnificent, uh, sorry, some of the granolas have had negative performance, the top uh, Magnificent Seven have just shot the lights out, albeit Tesla. Yeah, they've yeah. had negative performance. Tesla has. Yeah. Yeah. But there's one out of seven. If you look at... Um, Wasn't that one out of 11? No, nah, Nestle's down. Sanofi oh, was LVMH, down. Yeah. AstraZeneca's down. LVMH is down. L'Oreal's flat. Fair. So then you've got NVIDIA up 224%. Metal 136. So anyway... Um, I guess the question is, if you want to invest in these companies... You're just looking for the top 50 ETF just stock X. Don't look... So I don't think there are any granola ETFs no. out there now, but I think this is a classic example of where an index is a better option than a what a granola's index. Mm. Because a granola's index, if you bought it thinking long-term, you're really making a pretty undiversified bet on 11 
European companies. Mm. Whereas if you buy a European index, you get exposure to the performance of those 11 European companies. But you also get the built-in resilience in the investment product that if they start to fall away, they get smaller and smaller weightings in the index. They eventually could get the flick from the index. But more importantly, the new companies that are coming through and driving the growth of the index, you also get exposure to them as they grow. Um, and that you wouldn't get if you just bought a Granola's ETF. Yeah. And that's like, that is the real elegance and beauty of an index product. That companies die, but indexes are forever, as we titled a chapter in our second book. And might get tattooed. Don't stress, just invest. <laughs> um, indexes are like, they're the really, truly only bottom drawer investment. In my mm. personal, non-personal advice opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just because of the structure of that product. Um, and so, yeah, like I own a mainland Europe ATF in my core portfolio that I dollar cost average into. And so I'm you would have I'm had cheering these yeah. grand lars on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, they've contributed just like the Magnificent Seven to, I guess, outsized returns um, for the index. So, Do you own yeah. a Europe index? Yes, Nice. I don't own a FTSE. FTSE's yeah. dead to me. FTSE's... FTSE's dead. I noticed that it, of, all, of all the 11 as well. AstraZeneca? I, I think only one is London-based, yeah. Um, yeah, British. Oh, it's uh, British-Swedish. Hold on. No, AstraZeneca's listed in London. Uh, JSK? Yeah. Is it, and it's London, yeah. So yes. there's two. Two out of 11. Come on, UK. Yeah, well, I mean, what? The rest is Germany and France. Swiss. Oh, Swiss, yeah. Swiss yeah, does well. Doing well. Uh, ASML is Dutch. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, I don't have a FTSE, but I do have a European uh, ETF, so we'll have, we'll have benefited. But, Ren, let's take a quick break. On the other side, we're going to answer a community question about compounding. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to Equity Mate. Let's ask the community. Equity mate. Hey, Equity Mate. Hi, I just had a question. Hey, Bryce, hey, Bryce, Bryce. I've got a question. Your question answered. So we have a question that he's. So we have a question this week that has come from Matt Rose from the Equity Mates Facebook community that got a lot of uh, likes and interest. So we thought we'd bring it on the show and answer it. So, Ren, I'm going to read the question out. So give me a moment here. He says, hey, guys. Um, you recently laid out why compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. Now, we spoke about that in a previous episode. Link in show notes. Uh, link in show notes. And you've spruiked its magical, mythical qualities. Uh, but I was hoping you could talk about when compounding doesn't work and in those cases, what the trade-off might be. For example, I was fortunate en enough to buy Meta at a decent price and have held through the more recent growth. However, due to outside circumstances, I haven't been able to keep a consistent DCA into that holding or dollar cost average. Ignoring for a moment that Meta recently announced a dividend, I would assume that without dividend and without dollar cost averaging, I am not actually experiencing compounding, but just relying on value increase. Is my assumption correct? And if so, what does need to be in place for compounding to occur? Good question. Great question. We had a lot of people, we had a lot of people comment on that saying, I've been thinking the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm not able to consistently put money in and I don't have dividends or reinvestments on. Am I missing out on the eighth wonder of the world? Let's go. Well, I mean, the good news is you're not missing out conceptually where we should start is separating compounding and dollar cost averaging because compounding uh, happens whether or not you're adding to your investment mm. um, compounding happens because uh, your investment grows and then the year after it grows some more and it grows some more and a consistent rate of return over a long period of time becomes really powerful because you're growing not just your original investment, but all previous years returns. And that doesn't need to be cash. So let's use meta and use really simple numbers. Let's say you uh, put $100 in and it grows 10%. And that then gets to $110. Uh, then if meta grows 10% the next year, it's growing from that $110 base for you. And so you're adding you're getting $11 rather than the 10 because that's 10% of 110. And so then you have $121. And then the next year, if Meta grows 10% again, you're getting $12.10 rather than 
um, what you got in previous years. And so that's not you adding more to the investment and that's not you getting dividends and reinvesting. That's actually the value of your investment, the capital that, uh, the capital value of your investment growing consistently year after year without you doing anything. Hmm. That's the beauty of compounding. Hmm. Now you can supercharge compounding by dollar cost averaging and adding more to your investment. If you're getting dividends, reinvesting those dividends, those are all things that supercharge compounding. But don't worry, you're not missing out on compounding if you've just invested some money and not done anything more. Yeah. I think what's also important, Ren, is that uh, part of the question was around when doesn't it work? And like, does this apply to any investment? When we're generally talking about it as well, you know, we're, we're talking about it at an index level. We, we often say, you know, the market return or if you get, you know, the $100 challenge that we do on Get Started Investing, if you get 8% per year for 40 years, you get 350 grand, you know, those sorts of things. We're talking about that at a market level. Mm -hmm. Obviously, keep in mind that in, if you're individual stocks, it, they can go to zero and you're going to absolutely get no compounding. So, yeah. <laughs> But sure, but at the same time, individual stocks compound in the same way. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, like it's not an isolated thing. <laughs> it's just that they'll compound at a wide range of growth rates. Yeah. Whereas when we talk about this sort of 8% to 10% consistent growth, that's like the general average across markets market, for yeah. indexes. Yeah. But, you know, like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company has compounded at about 20% a year for 60 odd years. Mm. So everything compounds, things can compound down as well. Definitely. Like if you have a consistent declining growth rate, then you get very small very quickly. Mm. Well, it actually slows as the, the growth curve. But anyway, let's not worry about that too much. <laughs> um, so how's it different for individual companies? Like the principles are the same, but it's then like the rates of growth and fall can be different. Mm. And as we actually said in the earlier segment, you've got to remember that companies die, but mm. indexes are forever. Mm. So I think the stat is since the 1950s in the US, about 70% of companies listed on the stock market have gone bankrupt, which is wild to think about. Mm. But in that time, the index has just powered on and on and on because new generations of companies come to market and keep growing and, and do well. Um, and that's the difference between expecting compounding out of an index which is set up to be ongoing mm. and expecting compounding out of a company which is history shows often finite mm. so great question matt i hope we've been able to answer it if you are sitting at home thinking man i'm not able to put more money in to accelerate it don't fear you are not missing out on the eighth wonder of the world but keep in mind the beauty of compounding and where the magic really happens is over time and over a very long period of time, that's where things kick in. So just to put some numbers to it, um, if you had put, you know, if Matt had put $1,000 into Meta and we are getting that 8% return, no dividends, no additional investments, at the end of the first year, you, he would have $1,080 in terms of value of Meta. If he left it and it did another 8% at the end of the second year, it's 1,166. End of the third year, it's 1,260. And by the end of the 10th year, you're at 2,159. So you've doubled your investment over the 10 years if it's just compounding at 8% per year. That could assume some years it's up 10%, one year it might go down a bit, but on average, it's gone up 8% per year. So you can see there without having to put anything into it, um, you are, you are, what you would, I guess what people are saying, Ren, is this just seems like a capital gains, which it is, but every year the gain uh, is multiplied because of the capital base that you're starting with each year. Compounding is capital gains. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But it's co the, the compounding nature of it comes by keeping it in there time and time over a period of time and it just uh, exponentially grows. Yeah. Now, let me take your worked example and give you another worked example. Mm. Meta is up 136% over the past 12 months. Wow. If you put $1,000 in <laughs> and it grew at 136% a year for the next 10 years, wow. how much money do you think you'd have? Oh, um, $1,000 over 10 grand? Easy. 
Yeah, definitely over 10 yeah, grand. Yeah. You'd have $393 million. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's more than doubling every year. Yeah, that's true. So it's like one into more than two into more 300 than... 300 million. That's what it says here. <laughs> wow. A thousand into... Hold on, hold on. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. So from year one, you've got about a thousand. That goes to two and a half grand in year two, which goes to nine grand in year... Sorry, two and a half grand in year one, nine grand in year two, 34 in year three... 125 in year four, a bit shy of half a million in year five, 1.6 in year six, just shy of six in year seven, 21 and a half in year eight, 78 in year nine, 200. Oh no, that's just the, sorry. Anyway, yes, it's right. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to ask a question, head to equitymates.com slash contact. All the information is there. Uh, and you can also come and join us in the Facebook community group where there's plenty of conversation going on as well and if you want to fact check that compound interest calculator i'll put the link in the show notes you can't use the money smart compound interest calculator because they cap your total annual interest rate at 20 percent really yeah 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 yeah. but i'll put this other one in so you can put 10 years at 136 (laughs) percent and see what i just saw but couldn't really explain oh goodness me all right love it well that brings us to the end of our episode today uh, st- stay tuned tomorrow we've got buy or sell with Adam uh, in your feed so stick around for that and please if you can leave us a five star review and uh, yeah and a comment in your what in your podcast app that'd yeah. be really great yeah surely Fairlight are giving us a positive review after your <laughs> surely, little spruik <laughs> well uh, Ren always good to chat we'll leave it there sounds good <laughs>